Good morning, all of you. Good morning, ma'am. Can you all hear morning, me? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. morning. <laughs> welcome, welcome Good morning, all of you to Ask the Expert session. And uh, I am Meghale Sandal Kumar, and uh, I'll be the moderator of this session. Before we go ahead, a little bit about uh, All Ladies League. Some of you might be knowing, but uh, because there are lots of people from the public here, a little bit about uh, this organization. This is a global networking organization founded by Dr. Harbin Arora a few years ago, and it has chapters all over the world. And um, we have various uh, verticals and chapters within All Ladies League. And I am the India chairperson for digital transformation, Meghale Sendal Kumar, who will be moderating this session. And uh, me, along with Pramila Jain, who is also here, she is the Tamil Nadu chapter chair for digital transformation. We have started this Ask the Expert session one year ago, uh, a little more than a year, I should say. And this is the 15th session. And every month, we have some experts, invited experts, who talk about uh, any topic under the sun. And uh, you know, this is just for creating awareness to spread among the public. And today we have two esteemed speakers with us. Before I go to introduce them, uh, just a, a note of uh, you know uh, etiquette for a Zoom webinar. Please mute yourself, all of you. Please, can you all mute yourself? Yeah, Veera, can you see that everybody is muted because we don't want external. Yeah, disturbance is coming up uh, when the experts are talking. Yeah, thank you so much. So, a child, a newborn, as well as a child, you know, brings so much of joy into every family. We all have so many dreams because they spread so much of happiness. The dreams also, many will be our unfulfilled dreams, you know, we, we want our child to grow up into this or that and, you know, uh, transfer all our dreams to that child and we work all our two days okay for the tomorrow of your child okay everything is fine it is very good but what if something is amiss okay what happens if things are not as rosy as it would seem for the development of the child is that what uh, mm -hmm. is all about? Answer to this will be given by the experts sitting here and answer to many other questions. The basics of early intervention in child development, as well as the questions which you may have will be covered in this chapter. And uh, the session will be open for, uh, for uh, questions from you, you also after the, uh, the experts finish their talk. Before I hand over the floor to the speakers, a little bit of introduction uh, about uh, Lalita Sridhar first. Dalita Sridhar is a rehabilitation consultant, development therapist and educator, specialized in sensory integration and neurodevelopment therapy. She is an educator and counselor for children with development special needs and their parents. She has over 30 years of experience in the field of rehab of children with special needs in India and abroad. She has worked with children across age groups from early intervention to vocational training in developing intervention programs. The early intervention program of Lalita has received an award from Unilever for the impact on early childhood development and Lalita has also received an award uh, <clears throat> uh, rec by Fiki Flow recognizing the work in early intervention in rural areas. That's the professional side. Now Lalita the person. Lalita is known for her simplicity, punctuality and her willingness to help people in need. She'll never turn away anybody asking for help. She is very popular in her apartment, especially with the senior citizens. And um, I heard one incident uh, from my friend who introduced her. 
her to me, Mallika Swaminathan. She went out of the way to help her Ottoman's daughter to pass her 10th examination by tutoring her every day and also instilled a much needed confidence in her. And Lalita's role model, Sudamurti. Thank you, Mallika, once again for introducing me to this wonderfully accomplished person. Lalita, welcome to Ask the Expert, and we are all looking forward to hear from you. Welcome. Moving on to Richard Rakesh, our second speaker. I welcome Richard Rakesh, the behavior therapist, and here is a brief intro about Richard. Richard is a registered behavior technician. He has a master's in social work, medical, and psychiatric from the Madras Christian College. He has got several certifications and several specialties like strategies for crisis intervention and prevention, National Safety Council CPR and first aid, innovating in healthcare at Harvard X. Name of you. Richard has done research on the effect of music therapy on children with autism. Isn't that wonderful? It's an interesting subject by itself. Currently, Richard works in Smile Stones Child Development Center, India, 2018, from 2018. He worked previously for Anderson Center for Autism USA and also the SCARF. Now Richard is a professional person, you all know a bit, and Richard is a person. He's very polite and soft-spoken. I still remember our first phone call to Richard a few months ago. Uh, he loves music, plays the guitar and the keyboard, and guess what? All these skills, uh, I believe it is all self-taught. He is known for his humility and sincerity and loves to help people in need, especially the elderly. Isn't that a common streak between both our speakers today? Once a friend, always a friend, and he's a great listener. Richard Rakesh, our expert speaker for the day. Thank you for being here, Richard. And I should thank Suja Joseph for introducing me to Richard. And over to Lalita and Richard, you may add a little bit about yourself too. Before, before I hand over the floor to you. And we're all waiting for your presentation. And you can start with the basics probably of uh, early intervention. Before I hand over the floor, please mute yourself, the rest of you, so that we can have an uninterrupted uh, session. Over to you, Lalka and Richard. A warm good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Megle, for your kind words. Uh, still. I really don't know, but it feels very nice to be a part of this program today. Uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, should we start with the presentation, Megla? Yes, I think, uh, Richard, you can also say uh, a few words before I share the screen. Richard? Hello, everybody. I'm Richard. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be, be here with everybody here. Um, I think that what I have studied has come to a point that I could help everybody over here in this process. Uh, my expertise is in autism that I have uh, pioneered in doing a lot of other research and works. And I'm really thankful for Megra Man and Larita Man to share the channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, today's topic is importance of early intervention in child development. So early intervention is Aramba Nilai Kandaridal. Child development is Valarchi, Kurandayin Valarchi. The talk is going to move in this slide. So this early intervention is heard of a lot. So where do we apply early intervention? I think we have heard of it in every sphere of our life. Anything which is identified early the solutions are being, we are able to provide the solutions and we are able to find a cure for the whole issue or the problem. So today we are going to find out how early intervention helps to identify a child who is born with a developmental need. Actually, we see a lot, all of us see in our day-to-day -day life, typical children or the so-called normal children going to school, being happy, doing their academics, coming back home. But there is a whole world of children who are born with developmental delay, or we call it as Valarchik Kurai Padil. So what do we do? How do we get these children also to lead a normal life as the typically developing ch children is what this early intervention program is going to talk about and how it can help. Before we actually get into 
the answering the questions and getting into what are all the areas and the strategies we will speak about i'll just give me myself and richard will run through a small presentation of what actually we do in early intervention so the early intervention program or aramba nilai kandaridal and the program what do we do is first of all for anything we have to identify what is the issue so it carries with identification of developmental delay in young children eppa kandupidikalam that is always a question porandha anniki kuda sila vishayangala nammala kandupidikka mudiyum adukku we have to be trained like syndromes birth la vara defects all those can be uh, identified that's why we have put it as zero that is even in a newborn baby identification is possible there is always a myth that you know no no uh, first year of life it is not possible to identify a delay it is not so at different stages of a child's life in the first year of life it is possible to identify there is a developmental delay and the sooner it is identified the sooner it can be intervened that is the next step once we have identified that there is a delay with a the child then what do we do we just don't stop there we have to see what is it that we have to do to help this child overcome that delay which the child is going through so that is why we have to say that we have to have timely intervention to young children and with developmental delay and it should also start as soon as it is identified by doing these two what are we going to get we have to see how to mainstream every child into normal life because it is the right of every child to be included into the society and to catch up with their development and to lead a normal life so early intervention program consists of identifying the developmental delay providing intervention so that it helps the child sooner to catch up with his development or her development and be included into the mainstream society richard the conditions that can be facilitated by early intervention if you could see the slide i'm just working on the progress of children who have developed or at risk of developing a disability condition or other special needs that affect their overall now when you talk about disability just like how dalita ma'am was talking to you about when the child is being born there are certain defects that is being noticed now once the defect is noticed we need to make some but identifying a certain population and certain structure we identify what is the group of population that can be worked and noticing it the population of autism syndrome cerebral palsy development delay adhd and few others are some of the common features that we have seen understanding of what autism now we consider autism to be a spectrum disorder in a global development there is an umbrella in which everything works and moving on which signs and symptoms of autism like the ma'am explained it to you yeah autism is commonly what we have all of us heard today you know 10 years back autism was not heard of but today you hear autism very commonly being spoken about it is one of the condition which we see in children and uh, it is commonly seen that it is diagnosed only at the age of 3 but it is not so you can pick it up even at the age of 1 and 1/2 year if you are able to understand what are the signs and symptoms or even before that that this child might go into uh, you know a autism spectrum disorder so what are the common signs of autism which we can see and which we can pick it up early one thing is main characteristics are you have impairment in cognitive function impairment in communication impairment in social interaction all these things cognition communication social interaction starts developing from the day one of the child's birth so it is not necessary that we have to identify children with autism only at the age of 3 why we say that they are identified only at the age of 3 years the main feature in this is impairment in communication in our uh, culture we say a child will speak by age of 3 and by 3 if the child has not spoken then we seek help to find out 
okay, what is wrong with this child? That is why this age of three has become the common number. But even early, as early as one and a half, I sometimes feel even as early as three months, it could be diagnosed. Or we can at least try to say that this child is at risk. So we need to keep a watch and see that this child is able to catch up with his or her development. So what are the major signs and symptoms when we talk about it? Children with, uh, you know, uh, who are into this autism spectrum disorder have eye contact, delay in eye contact, or they don't engage with people who they are interacting with. Number one, when they are a patient or not, and the current number of packet. So that is one important feature you see in children with autism. Another thing, you call the child by name, name call response, we say. The child will not respond to you. You know, a common feature here is the child, when you switch on the TV, he will run to the TV. But when you call him by name, the child will not be responding to the name. The name call response and other things should come as early as six months. Engaging an eye contact should be as early as three months in the first year of life. So these two are early signs to pick up. This child may have some difficulty in, uh, you know, in the development. And so we need to provide the adequate intervention possible. The third thing which happens in children with autism is lack of communication. What happens here is expressive language. That is my ability to communicate my need, what I want, I need to do toilet. These are the things which are delayed in these child children. So that is another important sign which we can pick up. See, communication, we always say, is only by speech. It is not so. A child as young as six months to seven months to eight months will be able to say, I don't want, by just nodding his head. He, can, he need not speak and say no, or he need not speak and say yes, because words develop only at one and a half years. But gesturally, by nodding his head and by pointing, that is, I show something and I say, I want that. So these things the child will be able to do between six to nine months of age. And if the child has difficulty in performing this, these are the things that we should really look at as early signs or red flags to help this child to develop. Another important thing in children with autism will be limited play skills. Children start playing with things around them, with toys uh, as early as nine months. And uh, in start, uh, the, you will find that there is a difficulty in establishing proper play skills. In so we can summarize it as, so we see three months eye contact, six months name call response, then pointing and expressing the needs by nine months and then play skills by one year. These are all the mm. signs which we can say that children with mm. autism can be either, you know, at least can yeah. be identified, put at high risk, and we can help these children to develop. Moving on to Down syndrome, understanding the reasons of a decreased muscle tone delay a delayed motor milestone like sitting and standing, a short attention span and impulsive behavior, slow learning and delayed language and speech. Just like how Lalita Ma'am said, cognitively when we try to speak, the child is not able to pronounce the word properly or trying to build a language or trying to understand give ta, it, kuduka, or any particular skill that she try to he or she try to understand by trying to focus on. Now, the severity in down syndrome moves from mild moderate to severe understanding about the intellectual capacity and the disability of a particular child just like how we understand sometimes when he's trying to say no say for example a mother's child to school feed a child but by using a gesture saying no would be a rather proper communication of a, of a structure but in this we see a symptom of which is not yet accomplished which falls into the category of a science and symptom and also there is a developmental delay Focusing on the developmental delay, we understand a child is not able to fulfill the criteria of the milestone. If a child has to move around, walk, turn around, start sitting in a position where the child is not able to accomplish or complete the developmental mile, then we identify there is a lack and then we find the sign and the symptom of it. Some also have a learning clear disability. Now, Following into learning with disability is where we identify every structure of work in a process. Say, for example, when you go for a potty, 
training or for an ideal activity of work that we are trying to base there will be a certain delay that they'll be able to slow in learning one step for very very long period of time also this sign and symptom can actually be identified by a physical feature which is an unusual shape of features in the body people uh, children having like a small head or the short neck a poor muscle repetition and structure now moving on to cerebral palsy cerebral palsy is considered to be a proper brain disease developmental work causing a paralysis it is also considered to be a neuro developmental motor restriction hello yeah yeah delay in motor milestones so due to gross and finer motor skills now when we talk about cerebral palsy the one of the main features that we identify is a motor restriction in the body just like how we are able to move our hand more finitely by holding a pen in a very fine motor structure this will be a a difficult task in them trying to perform which we consider it to be a neural developmental blow now this is called mostly because of the damage in the brain causing a loss of muscle control which affects the parts of the brain now the early signs of the cerebral palsy is non progressive as we identify once it has been identified it continues for a period of time where we identify in problems of eating and swallowing difficulty in speaking learning difficulties and difficulty in performing adl skills adl skills are nothing but a skill where every day we get different different factors now if a child is not able to perform the adl skills the independence of living will be a very very difficult task in every instance we need to be there to help the child but through early intervention all of these factors can be moderated into a fact that they can help to live a happy and an individual life of self sustaining yeah now we are going to talk what are all the different areas where the child develop from the time he or she is born till it reaches 3 years and then it continuously keep happening till our last day of life so either that these are the major major areas which we see the child developing first one the it is neuromuscular development so what is neuromuscular development na it is to do with the muscles and movement so that is what we classified with a neuromuscular development adile rendu irukku one is gross motor skills and fine motor skills gross motor romba mukkiyam because that is what the child develops more in the first year of life that is sitting you can say ro- uh, crawling sitting standing walking idu nammala paaka mudiyara onnu namba ellarku theriyum kolanda onnu lende onne hal vayasukulla between 1 and 1 and a quarter year the child should be able to should start walking next is fine motor skills fine motor skills na gross motor skills la we use large muscles to develop fine motor skills la we use the smaller muscles of the hands chinna chinna muscles hal kai la irukirathu adha use panni vara valarchi da fine motor skills but adu romba important ena fine motor skills develop aana da future la kolandeyala eludha mudiyum than velaigalai seidukolla mudiyum the child will be able to do writing and all activities of daily living like eating holding ellathukume for all activities for us even though we are adults we need our hands without our hands we can't do anything but that is the development which happens in the fine motor skills which also starts in the first year of life sensory development namma konjam wait pannuvom we'll go to the other development and then we'll come back to that the next is the cognitive development so in the cognitive development la namma enna solrom anything to do with our brain like attention memory understanding association all these things are the functions of the cognitive development idu romba theva this is very very important because this forms the foundation for our future academic learning concept learning abstract adukallam this cognitive learning forms the foundation so that our the child's future academic learning is been enhanced next one the speech and language development what is speech and language development why we say speech and then why we say language there are two components in this always we think speech is what and language everything is the same 
what happens the difference between these two are the child has to develop both vocabulary understanding and convey it in a way that he is able to make others understand what he wants and also understand what others are telling and respond to them so speech consists of on the vocabulary that is the sound production of words language is using the grammar able to put the words together and make an understanding and communicate idu rendu seindu vandada communication is complete because in children with developmental delay words will come but understanding because of cognitive development will be a challenge language will be impaired they will not be able to express their needs and wants to others later during our session we will talk about how because of communication being impaired the child goes through a lot of behavior issues so ad romba romba it is a very important aspect of development next is the social development social development in our interaction with the society our interaction with the peers our interaction with the people our interaction with the environment around us forms the social development so but what happens in children with development delay is it is very very uh, hard and that becomes very challenging and that is the last development which really you know evolves because it 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 depends upon the other development like speech and language only when we are able to communicate only when we are able to speak only when we are able to establish an eye contact when we are able to give attention we are able to interact with our environment people around us so social development becomes a big challenge for children and that evolves only in the last phase of the developmental intervention then the functional development what is functional development means any valarchi which is required to perform our day to day function day to day function like eating toileting breathing everything comes under functional development we don't expect a young child of 0 to 3 to be functionally independent but what is required for the child to become independent develops in this stage of 0 to 3 so we should see that that development also happens at this stage of 0 to 3 because that's what will help the child to become functionally independent in this one thing which i have left is the sensory development because what is sensory development how does a child uh, you know learn that i have to roll in 3 months how does the child know that i have to get up and sit how does the child know that i have to move towards something which i see which i like how does this child respond to somebody speaking even by nodding the head have you wondered all this it is so beautiful that this happens only through our senses the child takes the information during the growing years of the first year of life through the vision through eyes through hearing through touch through their joints through their uh, you know another vestibular mechanism all the information from the world is being taken through the senses and the brain sees the world or transforms all these messages in such a way the child produces a response which becomes the learning otherwise you know it will be very difficult for the we don't teach the child you said it is 6 months we don't tell the child it is 9 months now you speak no it is so innate the information from the brain through the various senses goes through these sense organs and the nerves and the brain processes it and produces it and transforms it into an adaptive reaction or learning and that is how this whole development takes place and that is why i always feel the sensory development during the first three years of life child should be exposed to lot of you know sensory learning lot of touch that's why we say children should be cuddled children should be hugged children should be uh, the babies should you know we wrap them with a towel and uh, we have to but we should not overdo it because it becomes overwhelming for a small child so what is appropriate but in today's world they are cut off either children are in front of tv 
or there is no engagement with the child because the parents uh, and the caregivers are busy. So everything is now not at the adequate which needs to be uh, facilitated. So children should be exposed to a lot of sensory input during their growing years of life so that uh, other development takes place through the sense organs. Richard. Now, what are the causes for a developmental delay? As we identify that these are the development delays that we have seen. But there should be a particular reason depending on what could be the cause. Now, most of these are what we have seen. Say, for example, we talk about the autism. There is no particular cause for it. But there may be high risk of certain features that we have identified. Talking about the high risk factor, now, a child might be able to have these kind of uh, development delays and causes because of one, having a premature birth. A premature birth is something that when there is a due date, before three weeks from the due date, when a child is being born, they fall into the risk category that there might be chances and there might be prolonging and they could just leave away from it. Second comes the infection complications during the childhood having fever or having the jaundice or some other high society of infection that causes the child to go into a fever a long period of illness might actually cause damage to the genetic disorder. Then comes the genetic disorder, specifically speaking about the Down syndrome. Now, genetically speaking, from father and mother, we have X and Y chromosomes. When pairing up, everybody has to have 46. Now, there is one extra chromosome that identifies to be the uh, toxic chromosome that in the genetic disorder of Down syndrome, it causes the Down syndrome factor. Next comes the injury of the brain in cerebral palsy. Any infection or any fever or any other ways in which the brain is being injured causes a cerebral palsy with stiffness of the motor activity. Say for example, in a brain, if the cerebellum part is affected, it causes fine motor coordination to be very not repetitive. It not doesn't help the child to have a stiffness of muscles that they not be able to do. Following into the next category is a metabolic disorder. Any particular order, or, uh, organ that helps in metabolic condition of the body is not working properly if there is an impairment, the metabolic disorder of the food what we eat might not help them in proper uh, eating facility. Say for example that uh, food we eat like uh, organic disinfectants, lipids, amino acids, carbohydrates which are not helping the metabolism of a body can lead to a certain developmental delay. Finally comes into the mother's health during pregnancy and childbirth which is most most important part as the health of the parent determines the health of the child. When a mother is trying to, uh, is during the pregnancy time, uh, stress, uh, going through a lot of tension, uh, going through a lot of emotional abuse, actually cause a lot of factor to us. Also, talking about the physical factors of intake of toxic substances, uh, like uh, adulterated food or smoking or alcohol might definitely cause a high risk of development delay problems in the child where they are having in the home. Yeah. So what is the significance of uh, the early intervention program? So, uh, okay, what are the focus of the program, which we say is, it's not one size fits all and one program fits each and every child. It entirely depends upon the individual child's development and the individual child's uh, current developmental status and then you form the program. So the focus of the early intervention program is very specific. From newborn to two years, you focus mainly on the developmental milestone, which we spoke earlier, like sitting, standing, speech, cognition and other areas. In two to four, we need to look at the developmental milestone, but the main area has to be the communication because that is the stage when they rapidly develop communication. So that has to be focused and the school readiness also has to be another area of focus. Then four to seven, generally early intervention program is between zero to three, but I always work with children between zero to seven because a lot of children are identified only in school. It becomes so late only in school like ADHD. 
we call it as attention deficit hyperactive disorder where the child is not sitting and constantly moving there is no attention span it is a very very mild form of uh, you know uh, developmental delay which can be corrected it is only identified in the school by the teacher so a very very intense early intervention program helps the child to get back into the mainstream so four to seven we should focus on school inclusion and whatever intervention has been provided the child is able to generalize it into the mainstream society richard yeah focus on, after moving on from the focus of the program we move into the duration types of intervention yeah so first we identify hospital based intervention now trying to identify a child is uh, down syndrome is kind of identified in a very early stage now the doctor would be specifically telling what are the hospital based like having a medication or going through a therapeutic process or any other treatment which is helping them to have an individual program in a hospital based moving on to it we go to a center based intervention by the time the child is able to move around socialize we come to a point where a particular center a particular rehabilitation center would be able to help a child in focusing on the group activity just like how mebla ma'am described that 0 to 2 years will be a facilitated developmental mind school by 2 to 4 years will be a communication of school reliance a center based intervention is where it comes in between where we train up the child in particular skills intervening them say for example uh, giving a speech therapy to a child to be able to help her in a receptive and expressive communication now what is the receptive a child is trying to understand what the parent or anybody is trying to tell now when we say no to the child the child will understand the fact that somebody is telling no to her. when they say like uh, come here we use a gesture of communication telling them giving a command to a child telling that you please come sit down understanding and then acting towards it expressive is that once the process is taken in the child has to react to it express herself or express himself out by giving a process so the child would come and sit or the child would say no or the child would say yes i want it so these are the ways in which we 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 chisel a child's uh, characteristics in a center based also in centers we have occupational therapy speech therapy behavior therapy and other intervention programs then along with it become the home based program giving a one hour therapy or two hours of therapy in a center based intervention will definitely not help much for a child when therapy is actually taken home by the parent that's why a parent training counseling is very very important because a parent kind of facilitates the program of the intervention throughout the lifestyle of the of the of the child so that the child can start interacting and working the functional communication of the program much effectively in the child's lifestyle based on this we also move into another category called as the school based intervention program now the center based intervention program and a um, home based intervention program are the two programs that help the child to move to one place to another place which is to a school school is where a socialization of teachers friends and they communicate with a lot of other people this is where the teacher or a proper therapist or a counselor would be able to take the in charge from there by intervening in the school trying to identify what are the particular ways in which a child can be intervened to help in a proper systematic way of learning that is exactly that just like how lalita ma'am mentioned there is something called the iep individual education plan sitting down a group of therapists to identify and work it out a multidisciplinary team has been organized to set to identify these are the things the child is being taught these are the things the child is practicing in school these are the things the child will be able to progress along with the group of students that the child is able to progress so these are the types and duration of intervention that we work on yeah we finish with the last slide uh, what is the significance why do this early intervention program you know it's immense to say it's very very immense children who are in the mild category of developmental delay and moderate category of development delay, they, they, they will not be pushed into the category of special needs if early intervention is given to them and it is done effectively. So what happens because of this? Many children who have developmental issues are being included and mainstreamed into the society. By addressing the development issue, 
very early in life, future academic delay can be prevented and these children catch up with the academics and they are able to do regular schooling like every other typically developing child. Thank you so much. This is just a gist of what an early intervention program comprises of. Now I think Meghlai, the floor is open for questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, Lalita and Richard. I think as layman, at least I am a lay person here uh, with regards to early intervention. Now uh, the awareness uh, is there, what, you know, humongous uh, feel this is and how important it is for every parent to know about early intervention. And I have a few questions, uh, you know, before we open the session for the public. Yes. Uh, you know, lots of information keeps getting uh, bombarded towards us through social media, WhatsApp. And I feel, um, you know, uh, lots of myths are associated with the early intervention. You know, can you just uh, throw some light on which is a myth and which is the truth, you know, from experts like you? Right. See, uh, I would go one step further even than the social media and this thing, even the myth at home, if a child is not speaking, it's okay. You know, the older people at home say, you spoke late. So the child, it's okay. He can also speak late. And then gender, you know, uh, some in some houses they say, yeah, he's a boy, he'll speak late. So these things do happen. So by the time, you know, the parent overcomes all this and comes, for an identification, it becomes too late and the child is already into the special needs category. And there is another thing like, you know, children who have developmental delay and children who are having some issues are capable of nothing. They are ever a special needs. It's not true. You know, some children with autism, they really have exceptional skills in math, like Shakuntala Devi, like, you know, the recent movie which has come, there are children who are extremely good at numbers, which you and I cannot even imagine that children, but we don't know to identify and we don't want to acknowledge their strengths and we don't want to provide them the adequate intervention and move that forward. A very common, this thing is children who are born with difficulty, who are born with developmental delay are, that's it. We don't identify their strength we don't work on what, whatever is still, uh, what are the areas which is really, really developing well and identify their strength and help them to develop in those areas. Rather, we think that the child has to typically develop like other children, read, write, and do what we want to do and take them in that line. And that is a big misnomer which we really need to, you know, uh, correct ourselves. Every child who is born or every individual is born is born with a potential and a strength. It is the society and us, we don't know to identify and we all go in one particular way telling that this is what the child should fall into. Because of that, we push the child as not capable or not able to do anything and make this child, uh, you know, uh, uh, into the category of special needs. And uh, uh, I, I would say make their lives miserable. 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 Okay. Thank yeah. you, Lalita. I think that was, you know, very important uh, point which you said. Parents, I hope you're all listening. And uh, one question for parents, you know, the emotional stress for parents is tremendous. You know, yes. so some identification happens. They go through a lot. So yes. do you have a word of advice for the parents because they play a, play a very primary role, right? Yes. Uh, especially in identification as well as, uh, you know, developmental activities. So uh, one word of advice and... Uh, for the parents, what would you say, Talita? Yeah, you know, they are basically young parents, you know, when it comes to early intervention, it, it is basically their first child or the second child who has been identified this way. They are into the age group of between 23, 24 plus to 32, that, that is the age, where they are wanting to start their career and they have a big whole world of dream in front of them. And they think, you know, that's a bundle of joy which has come into their life. And suddenly something like this is diagnosed. I feel, uh, you know, more than the father, it's the mother who goes through a lot of emotional and physical stress. Because she is the caregiver of the family first, and she's the caregiver of this child. And uh, she's being blamed for this child being born like this too. And uh, she has to cater to everybody's needs. And she's also, uh, required to get involved 100% in the child's program. So she goes through a lot of emotional and physical 
uh, stress. So what, what is very important is proper periodic counseling that we are there to help this child and help them to understand what exactly is happening. Every child who is born with a developmental delay need not get into disability. That is something we need to uh, you know, ensure that the parents understand. But on the contrary, we need to help them to understand that it is very important to be with the program. What happens is this journey is long. It's not as easy as what we are speaking here for an hour. It is sometimes two years with a child, they are going through the early intervention program. So we need to provide adequate counseling support and handholding for that period of time. It is much more important than the early intervention to the child. I would say, so in, when we work together as a team, any day a parent is, you know, requires a help, we drop everything and sit with the parent for 10 minutes and counsel them because the journey is long, the journey is difficult, and it's the mother who goes through a lot of things because fathers somewhere, they have to go to the job and earn their living. So we really, really have to take that as the priority and work on the emotional and the physical well-being of the mother and handhold her and they need to know how to seek help from the center where they are taking the intervention and we can have small support group of parents young parents who will be peer counselors for each other till the child develops and reaches you know the appropriate uh, developmental milestone catch up with the development yeah, support groups. Support groups are so important. So sir. important. Support so important. Groups are important. And yeah. periodic counseling is also very important because mothers play multiple roles in this exactly. whole journey. They wear yeah. so many hats. So they wear so roles. many hats. Yes. So this uh, support groups you were talking about. So you have you have been part of uh, counseling parents as well as support groups, right? Yes. So parents, please note. Uh, those who, you know, the contact information of Lalita, Sridhar and Richard will be posted here. So you can spread the word. You know, they are doing some human service for, the, for society. I think awareness should spread. Uh, thanks, Lalita, for that answering that question. The next question is for Richard about behavior. You know, we all know as uh, toddlers, the terrible twos and a little uh, over that also. How to differentiate between, a, you know, ordinary temper tantrum and actual problem, you know, behavioral problem with the child. Sometimes it may be just masked as a temper tantrum. Uh, so you, can you throw some light on that? Yes. Now, uh, when we present a word stating that it is a problem, now we need to define what a problem could possibly be. In terms of behavior, behavior is a characteristic features of understanding a group of things together. Say for example, I am hungry and I want food. So I go to the kitchen and search for the food and I'm trying to take it. Now, mommy or daddy tells me no stealing. Now I'm hungry. I'm not able to have function of communication. So I'm trying to take the food immediately. Over a period of time, I learn a particular style or a behavior that the moment I see food, I probably take it, not understanding whether what the cause or an effect would be. So that is exactly how a behavior starts molding in a child. Now, when I try to do something unnecessarily, according to the social terms, then what happens is that I've been tagged a line stating that I always do like this. Now, the word always represent a repetitive behavior. We call it as a stereotype. Now this is where we identify there is a behavior that is fully blown, that is big and is not able to work it out. Now all of us have a term, right? Like uh, once we get used to something, we feel more comfortable in that area. That comfort kind of like puts you into a category where we feel that, uh, yes, this is my area. I'm the king of this place. I'll do whatever I feel want to. Now, in a social setup, this becomes a part where a child is not able to work it systematically. Um, in this development, what we identify is a child is putting a tantrum. What, the tra what is the reason for the tantrum? So we identify a reason. Now, identifying a reason, we call it as four functions. Now, understanding the four functions of why a behavior is evolving. First, when a child wants to escape, 
the child puts a tantrum or the child wants to escape from a task or from a difficult work the child is being given to the child basically doesn't want to do it the child feels oh this is very boring for me this is very dull this is not giving me any idea or happiness so i don't want to do it but the child is not able to communicate it the child doesn't feel how to say it out but we are trying to force the child to do such just exactly how beautifully lalita ma'am said we need to understand the thought of a child by not segregating the child but to be more inclusive in everything what we are trying to do so the behavior of putting tantrum the reason is the child wants to escape then the child is not able to communicate say for example i want attention from my mother to get a hug and i'm not able to do it so i'm shouting or putting tantrum the moment i do it somebody is coming and hugging me and giving a warm hug telling that okay no problem be relaxed be chill okay and then i understand okay fine every time i cry i get a hug or every time i put tantrum i get a hug or every time i break something i get a hug so what happens is the functional communication throughout our life the reaction of what other people around us is teaching us step by step to create a behavior now if the behavior keeps on continuing for n number of times then comes the problem then we identified ide vishita even tripi tripi pandita raka she is doing the same thing again and again and again then it's becoming very very monotonous adanal so we have a lot of problem to try to change the behavior of the child now trying to identify the cognitive function or kolandiyoda learning capacity when we tell a child no the child understands but not every child is able to understand some children who have a delay in understanding will take a long period of time to understand until then what we do is we outburst we get emotionally frustrated we get irritated so what we try to do we try to use force by hand which is typically lot of parents trying to push the child telling that you better be quiet or else normal yes that is so this factor kind of triggers the child's understanding of okay if i do something wrong something will happen but there are a lot of chances yeah, for the child to uh, meet the rose milk one minute uh, uh, can you please uh, one minute richard uh, can you mute us uh, please veera can you mute the person thank you veera yeah sorry richard please go no problem sometimes what happens is when the when the child is trying to imitate the parent say for example the parent like i the child might also be able to imitate telling that i and when a child is when a parent is telling adi the child might also start imitating the word adi and then, so what happens when the child goes into a social setup the child will start imitating the same behavior to other people and if the person who is handling the child is not able to work on the child then the problem becomes very huge we get lot of complaints from outside places telling that your child is this this is so and so and everything so in development factor also when we are trying to teach a child in little by little setup this helps the child to mold the behavior of the child to work and understand in ways how a child will develop step by step program to facilitate in a social environment also with people around them and also within the family so teaching the child you want chocolate you can ask me chocolate and i will give you rather than putting a tantrum we are choosing an alternative behavior to teach a child telling that this will help you on the chocolate this will not help you on the chocolate so that is as a help we identify a problem and a behavior and we combine it and we work it out wonderful wonderful explanation richard that was uh, you know enlightening for many a parent here who is uh, listening spare the rod and spoil the child addi addi na adikirathu you know you gave that example so beautifully and a child develops வீட்ல யாரு எப்படி இருக்காங்களோ அதை அப்படியே எமுலேட் பண்ணுவாங்கிறது ஒன் நைஸ் எக்ஸாம்பிள் யூ கேவ் தட் வாஸ் வெரி குட் ரிச்சர்ட் தேங்க் யூ ஃபார் ஆன்சரிங் தட் கொஸ்டின் ஸோ தெர் இஸ் அ ப்ராப்ளம் இஃப் இட் இஸ் ஐடென்டிஃபைட் திஸ் கொஸ்டின் டு லலிதா ஸோ விச் டு யூ திங் ஹேஸ் டு பி அட்ரெஸ்ட் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் வெதர் இட் இஸ் ஸ்பீச் ஆர் சோஷியல் ஸ்கில்ஸ் ஆர் ப்ராபப்ளி காக்னேட்டிவ் ஸ்கில்ஸ் ஆர் சம்திங் எல்ஸ் ஸோ விச் டு யூ திங்க் வில் கம் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் லலிதா a yeah, good question you know when we have children at home who is it, who, which one would we like more it's sort of something we mix that like 
uh, you know, as it goes, all when we put in the previous slide from the motor development to we put six areas, yeah. all are equally important. I spoke about the sensory development, which is the gateway for other development to happen. So that has its own importance in its own way. But after speaking all this, I would definitely say communication has to be established somehow in a child. Okay, even if the child is not walking, but if you are able to help the child to communicate, it opens the whole world for them. Imagine a state, I'm not able to express myself and I'm not able to, others are not able to understand me. Neither am I able to you know, communicate with them. It's a very frustrating feeling. Okay, and it actually emotionally also, it uh, brings down the self-confidence of the child and that forms a very, very important role. Uh, it uh, prevents the child from developing further. So at any stage, I would say communication should have its 100 plus more focus. So somehow, whether the child is verbal, nonverbal, speech and language and communication, we have to open up that channel and intervene that area and focus it a lot more and somehow help the child to develop in that area. Because if I'm not able to communicate, as Richard said in the previous slide, a lot of behavior issues comes. I'm not able to communicate to somebody. I'm not able to make other person understand what I'm feeling through. Okay. And I get frustrated. When I get frustrated, what do I do? I throw tantrums or I throw things. I do so many other things. So even in children with developmental delay, if you want the behavior issues to come down, even in a typically developing child, communication plays a very important role. In today's uh, you know, time, Parents don't have that time, even with a typically developing child, to communicate and understand what the child is going through. So from the development per perspective, in a child with developmental delay, communication should be one of the main, main focus. It cannot be left. It has to be addressed because it helps to emotionally develop the child, develop the child in other areas, and prevent behavior issues. The next most important thing is functional skills or the activities of daily living because a child will already delayed. And if you are not able to help the child to uh, take care of his needs, for some reason, the child gets into the spectrum of special needs. You find parents with 22 years and 23 year old children or young adults who are still not toilet trained. What an amount of stress to the parent? You know, it is unimaginable. Children who are young adults who are 22 years old, not able to take care of their bathing needs, not able to take care of their toilet needs, not able to take care of their eating needs. And the parents go through stress all through the journey of their life with this child. So another important thing is, as I told you, zero to three, only requisites which is required for uh, performing the daily skills are formed, but we have to work at it so that by the child, time the child is six or seven years old, his ADL skills are developed to his maximum capacity and potential. If for some reason the child is not able to reach there, we have to find adaptive means and somehow our goal should be to reach the child to become independent in this because that will really, really help the parents to uh, you know, uh, handle this child and provide the caregiving in a much more efficient and a stress-free way. Yeah. Wonderfully explained. Uh, wonderfully explained. See, uh, you know, as uh, late as 21, if a child is not toilet trained, imagine the stress which a parent goes through. And what about, uh, you know, economic uh, dependence and so many other factors also come into the player picture. So, another, another important thing here, what happens is, Parents think my child is not able to do all these things uh, and I'm getting old. Yes. Who will take care, care of my, my child? And, you know, imagine if the child is, if the young adult is able to manage himself or herself, somebody will be able to say, okay, I can put him in some home or hostel. But it doesn't happen, you know, when the child is not, when the young adult is not able to take care of his needs. So it has to start right from day one or, you know, the initial formative years of zero to three. Yes, that comes to a very big discussion about what happens to these children when they grow up and what happens when the parents are old or they're too old to take care of and what if they die and go away, who will take right. care of them? Right. That's a whole new topic, a whole new area. 
with society we as people are we have to address you know what will these uh, children you know they are all uh, adults but in the child uh, form what will they do i think uh, something needs to be done you know it was good you mentioned about this and uh, talking about this you know schools some people um, i think uh, richard can answer this question because uh, uh, it's about schools and how children in schools nowadays everything is gone online it's all the more difficult now online school but uh, children with developmental delays how to sensitize regular schools to deal with these children you know i've been a teacher for a decade i know you know classes uh, it is a homogeneous class with uh, all kinds of uh, levels of children but with developmental delay uh, student and a generic class a teacher just uh, teaching addressing the class is that enough can the child survive in a regular school or something more is needed uh, richard try to understand this book uh, yeah. let us go into more child specific and try to understand first what a child can and what a child cannot when we identified a deficiency or a delay we categorize into mild moderate and severe now a child is having a severe de uh, uh, deficit it is highly not possible for the child to sit for a long period of time so we might be only forcing a lot of pressure on the child stating that you do this you do that the child is falling into moderate category with little of help the child be able to function a lot of ways which might be much easier now if a child falls into a mild category which is no different from what exactly what others also do the child will be actually able to sustain through the procedure of how things work now understanding the child's capability and capacity that is exactly that how lalita ma'am mentioned individual education plan or individual developmental plan first working with the parent to so and so so and so step by step teach the child in a very systematic progress and to condition the child to develop a particular skill of how she could sit or how she understands particular words to understand now say for example i am not able to understand a particular sentence but i am able to grasp one or two words out of the sentence and trying to understand it if i am able to sit through a class and if i am not able to understand there should be a shadow teacher or a caregiver who's by the side of me who teaches me or specifically tells those particular words for me to understand so that it might create that understanding procedure and it might build up my interest in what i am trying to do and if i am not understanding anything and there's no interest at all and if someone is just forcing me to just sit and just listen to what i'm trying to not to do will obviously create a lot of confusion and problem now schools should very clearly understand if they are specifically working with a child who is having a developmental delay or a delay or a specific facility now say for example lot of kids who fall in the autism spectrum just like how lalita ma'am said they are brilliant in mathematics the moment math class come they are just too involved they like to sit and just do everything step by step more interested in it by the time they go to history class is too much of words and too much of thinking of a person is more of understanding the biography of the person which a child is not interested at all understanding the interest of the child or the capacity of the child able to sit through is something that we should be first understand and work through the progress of the child now if a child is not able to sit it we should always find the tolerant level we always say if you are able to sit for 5 minutes that will be good so during that 5 minutes without any behavior the child will be able to adjust and then work it out slowly we progress the level by moving it step by step but in this phase as we could see the changes are very not helpful for all of us but we could always have a systematic way of teaching it step by step more inclusive in proper school setup as of now no school is happening but in a working in a school environment a proper infrastructure is more more needed for the child to move in a social way and a school must should have an individualized insurance policy for the child so that the child's education needs throughout the lifetime might be actually too costly so that they could be able to work this out through the process which cannot be a burden for the parent and the government should have proper policy making for the children so that they give a lot of 
recommendation for these kids to move step by step ahead in life for them to work it out and the teacher should be sensitized or know the fact that what disability it is how to work on the particular style of the disability what is the child's strength what are the ways the child could help and what are the ways they could shadow the teacher and also in a social environment or in a classroom when the child is trying to adjust with the other kids the other kids should be sensitized so that they also know what is the deficit around how the child can work through the procedure and how they can also in a way step by step contribute towards it but if a child is at the home the parent and the caregiver should also do the same way of contributing step by step along the way and overall everything the curriculum should be designed in a particular way for the child so that the child knows these are the ways in which i could learn progress and do all the activities just like how lalita ma'am said the adl activities now we could do through sound we could do through music we could do through by actions teaching them this is what the whole progress is so the child by the time the child comes home the child understands oh the teacher taught me this mama is doing the same thing so the morning when the child is doing the brushing or going the potty the child understands through in the potty time i could do all this both the bathing comes like this so more effective so every step of step learning in the school progress helps us to come to function where and sensitizing the parents the teachers the students around and the community through a lot of seminars programs like this workshops will definitely help a child to prolong this process i just Thank have you. one more point to add on to this yeah lalita you know regular teachers have this bet courses where they talk only about teaching a typically developing child i feel we should look into incorporating both you know children with challenges and the normal uh, teaching a normal typically developing child because that is now a separate bed and some anywhere in india if you have to teach a child with special needs and if he or she is in the school they are not equipped to teach rather i would say so that is where the challenges the management also poses a lot of challenges on the teachers so the bed can have a component of both the special ed and the normal ed that would be really great and number 2 is sensitizing the teachers on the strategies and uh, you know how to handle the children that will be really nice and the third thing is taking the taboo of these are special children or these are children with some difficulties so because what happens is the moment i get into that i want to send them away school send them away there is no way of including them into it so we all should work towards that there should not be a separate school for children with needs and typically developing children that should be the future i am looking at to see that all the children go because children interacting with the typically developing children and vice versa has its impact on the development of both the children thank you that was wonderful lalita see sensitizing children especially uh, the children who are normal okay right. their uh, their you know attitude towards these children who who require some special care is so 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 important i hope uh, somebody is listening who can change uh, a lot here in this education uh, you know teachers uh, these days are their hands are tied they have I, they, I, they just cannot do anything because you know they have the pressure of completing the portions and now everything is gone online you know how hard uh, life is now but uh, you know segregating them is bright and backward bright and backward you know i heard one uh, teacher tell me why don't you you know mix them up like that bright backward bright backward but you know a child when uh, he is tagged as backward you know isn't that uh, uh, you know a psychological aspect which goes okay, backward you know uh, who 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 certifies that child is backward you know that's quite wrong i thought um, you know those things have to change i hope uh, awareness spreads and yeah. let's hope and uh, richard the one question for you here is uh, nutrition i hear a plays a very important role we all know in pregnancy how important nutrition is uh but is there any specific diet uh, which uh, children needs to be need to be given you know for all round development i mean yeah, as a layman i'm asking i'm not sure whether this question is right whether it is there or not or gen just general diet is enough but let me ask the expert uh, richard here in terms of diet we always understand just like how a development pediatrician says uh mother's breast milk This is one of the most key component. From that, we just want to step by step. Now, by the child, when they child by the month of six or seven, when they start using solids, we identify also the delay, and we also identify the child is sub 
choose to be very picky in what they want to do. They like to be only tasting the food what they've been doing it for a long period of time, or they like to taste or explore in the food only which is not solids, which is more semi-solid or smashed, uh, or one particular flavor of food. Now, uh, oral sensory or the taste is particular characteristic feature what we kind of seeing in a behavior pattern recently and there is a lot of research which is being developed over a period of time now but as nothing has been fully developed identifying and understanding all these factors and research papers we come to a conclusion that every child has to have a proper nutrition value for the development of the child we trying to identify and cutting down certain vitamins or certain nutrition will definitely not help the child. So, a child should be given the proper nutrition at proper period of time. Now, the child is not eating. The child is trying to be only specific and eating and things. We have to find the alternative way of how we can mix some nutritious food along with the food what they like to eat along and see and how the child has been able to do it. Now, Moving on to the oral motor activity, the child is not able to munch. The child is finding difficult to bite. The child tongue movement is not able to do it. The child is always swallowing the food. Then we have to be very specific in what style on what quantity we are giving the food. Now, if we know that giving a solid food is causing choking problem to the child, we have to mince the food properly and give it to them. Now, understanding based on their disability, if a child falls into a severe category, they might, by, uh, by birth, might have the deficiency of not able to bite, chew and eat. They might only swallow the food. Now, the child's health and the safety is more important to us than a lot of other things. So, we need to make sure that the child doesn't consume any food that which is whole that the child might end up having a choking problem and end up in a very fatal phase. Now, this is developed more important during the, uh, uh, the nutrition part where it plays because some child likes to eat their favorite food and when it's not minced, they might be able to take it immediately and put it in the mouth, what we don't know or what we don't see and might end up in a very fatal situation. This should be addressed in a very uh, important way and a person should be always very careful about it. If the child is able to understand what we are trying to say, then it is a different way of handling. So that shouldn't be a problem. Also, recently what is happening is there is something called the gluten-free diet and the casein-free diet. People say there is a gut. Now, there are a lot of researchers that are emerging telling the gut in the stomach has a leak that is causing to a lot of behavioral problems. So what parents are trying to do is this. Certainly, I have came to know that a lot of parents are trying to cut down a uh, a lot of wheat, a lot of uh, probiotics that the child is able to take in the food what they are trying to do. But this actually somewhat kind of reduces the vitamin nutrition the child needs to get. So if they are trying to focus on one particular diet, now to be very careful on what I am saying, there is nothing we mean absolutely proved in a very scientific way. There is no particular population of people that the science have proved saying that throughout the, this population of uh, down or AST or cerebral palsy, this particular diet helps them a lot. It is only very child specific. So we can't come to a global understanding or global decision telling that casein free diet or gluten free diet will actually help the child. But when a parent is trying to understand this information from other people, then they shouldn't come to a conclusion by cutting down the nutrition values and the vitamin values so that the child will only suffocate from mal malnutrition and deficiency. Which the parent which always feel the child health is more important. They should always have the proper vitamins and the minerals what they have, which is very, very more important for the child. And the diet factors, having a proper nutritional dietitian for a child and having a counseling or a session with them would actually help the parent to know what can be done and what cannot be done. A professional might actually really help in the situation. And if for parents who think that uh, casein-free diets and gluten-free diets are actually helping them, they can continue with it, but let them always find an alternative way 
to give those nutritions and the vitamins what the child is missing so that would be my uh, personal opinion on that begle i'll just add on to this sure lalita yeah see one thing in a child's diet in our culture which we really have to follow is we are you know in the first year of life too much of salt is not needed for the child's digestive system which is very young which is developing number 2 sugar you know a lot of this is for both typically developing children and children with needs you know a lot of hyperactivity is associated with surge of sugar in their metabolism you can find parents telling yesterday he ate chocolate today he is jumping all over <laughs> okay you can it's a very common term even in our area where you know children with this thing so we do tell them please avoid white sugar chocolates cakes cream pastries because these directly get into the blood and cause a surge in their sugar where you know they don't know they don't can't control themselves and it it causes a lot of challenge in their outside exploration and focusing and attending as richard said the cfgf without the casein and the gluten casein is in the milk and the gluten is in the wheat so we do tell gluten that please you know avoid biscuits because biscuits is a deadly combination of wheat and sugar so you don't know whether the sugar is causing it or the wheat is causing it because we don't ask the child to go so things which are absolutely not necessary because sometimes you find parents uh, you know lack of time they'll give two packets of biscuits to the child and that is what is sent as a snack to school and that is what the child eats and too much of all these things really causes a surge which you know really is detrimental to the child's development so gluten what we say is we don't ask the child to completely wean off but we say follow it for 21 days like avoid anything with wheat maida and the refined flour and see if there is any change in the pattern and it's hard because there is another child at home and you have to make chapatis you have to make this so you cannot give instructions to a parent which is very challenging they will not do at all and it's of no use so you work in small portion you task analyze it in such a way put us into that position will we do it and if they see the changes they really come back to you and if you don't see the changes you know we just say yeah, go back but moderate it don't give two packets of biscuits and three packets of biscuits because it's just not going to help the a uh, child at all and another thing is the chips you know we do tell people please as parents avoid food stuff which have preserves because they do have a lot of impact on the child's developing internal organs and systems when the internal organs and systems are in harmony with the external then only you can have development happening when there is a chaos inside because you have abused it by giving things which is not conducive to that internal environment it is hard to digest okay where is it that the child is going to you know uh, take on what is happening around it for instance if i have a stomach upset and i need to do this presentation where will my concentration be finally you say the child is having attention problem i don't know the strategies how to get the child to focus and attend but so we need to take care of what goes inside the child what what the child eats because that will help the internal system at ease so that the child is able to respond to the external stimulus it's a very very important thing and in my 30 years of working i found this we need to handhold the parents and keep moving it up and down and not a diet and not one thing fits all another thing is some food children with uh, developmental delays do have lot of issues on constipation they don't pass stools for four days you know what a terrible pain that is all of us get this when we are 60 plus imagine a parent has to go through a child who is having this and there is sort of things which is going on in the digestive system and in the bowel mm-hmm. the child doesn't eat the child doesn't pass stools and it's a, it's a big challenge for the parent to handle when you moderate the diet yeah. little high fiber so that uh, and the cut down on gluten definitely cut down on preserves definitely cut down on sugars you feel the child's uh, body is ready to take the external stimulation and learning and development takes place much more efficiently yeah i think lalita uh, portion control also lalita some yes. children don't know you know how, when to stop portion control <laughs> the portion control another thing is giving children to bite and eat oh. today parents just put it in the mixer 
and they give it i'm not talking about children who have delays even normal children because you don't have time and they swallow it and you know if you are a first time parent you feel the child has to eat this much hunger is from the child it's not from us but we don't accept that as a mother i am really you know anxious this is the bowl i want this child to eat even if the child refuses you leave i keep telling all my parents when i counsel don't worry hunger is one thing that the child will come back it is from within his or her body you can't guide how hungry the child is so they mash everything and they give it sense of taste doesn't develop okay the child doesn't develop an interest to the food when the sensory development is taking place biting and chewing is lost oral muscles are not stimulated thereby speech becomes a lot more challenging because you need all these muscles to produce the words the speech and language so we add on to whatever the child is going through and then finally say the child is not capable of this and not capable of that another thing which i would like to tell is please don't feed the child making them sit in front of the tv and computer their attention has to be on what they are eating the child is already not having attention okay and then here you have already put the tv on and he is not even knowing whether it is the rice which is going in or whether how do you teach a child this is carrot and the carrot tastes like this it is by looking by seeing by eating all the senses working together that's why i brought the sensory learning to the last day but what we do yeah we want them to eat fast we want them to finish it the child is looking he doesn't even know what he has eaten whether his tummy is full i find sometimes after eating the parents will say he vomited because it's been over full you have stopped his communication you have stopped him from telling i want i don't want this is very very typical even in a you know typically developing uh, child and in today's household and parenting because nobody has time for anything today it becomes quite challenging and that is where we put a uh, you know somewhere we only block the development happening so please give them lot of things to explore through the mouth as much as hands different taste different textures let them bite and eat if they want to pick and eat let them pick and eat because some things you can't teach perceptions of what things are develops through that and the child is able to develop the oral muscles where it communicates so these things have to be taken in mind when we are doing that feeding yeah sorry megla i think i took a little time no i think it's the passion in you you know <laughs> we just cannot uh, we have to just something which is close no, to you your can't heart no you can stop me right? uh, megla no not issues not at all not at all it's so useful for so many people here and uh, you know what about sleep cycles i mean early to bed and early to rise yes you know, make the man healthy wealthy and wise but what about these children uh, sleep cycles how should it be yeah sleep a very very important aspect how do we feel when we don't feel when we have not slept properly one day we are fine two days we are fine third day we get angry fourth day we don't want to do anything fifth day we are frustrated then we see whether we need to seek a doctor is any any development or learning happening sleep is very very important for anyone from zero to whatever stage of life after 50 60 we do say we do have sleep disturbances and there is something called rhythm you know in our body if we are awake for this many hours we have to sleep for this many hours because when we sleep it is the time when the body repairs itself and grows the organs and in children with developmental delays you see that there is a lot of rhythm alteration children no, sleep at 3 o'clock no. in the morning the children sleep don't sleep when they are able to sleep but once they wake they are not able to go back to sleep so it it is a big challenge for the parent so when the rhythm we one of the main thing in i do in counseling is help the parents to set this rhythm right one thing is the child itself has its own issues because of a secretion of a, ham, a chemical enzyme which is imbalanced in these children another thing is we don't have a proper sleep hygiene and routine for the children they are allowed to watch tv before going to sleep then we go to lay sleep late children go to sleep late no that's not acceptable at all children need that 10 to 12 hours of sleep and they need to be put to Uh, you know sleep maybe here and there half an hour variation but at a regular period of time 
one only then their mind will be fresh to attend to next day's school or learning or development to take place imagine the sun thinks i can rise any time and i can set any time what a confusion the four doors that is what happens to a child as and when he sleeps as and when he gets up it's for all of us we are able to express we say we don't want to go to work or we just take rest but the child is not able to express and it becomes a big challenge for the parents to handle them because it complicates the whole day to day activities too so it is to do with the sleep hygiene and how uh, we train the child and the child's ability to for you know have the proper rhythm and routine and sleep is the most important factor in a child's development and of course for us to don't we all like a good sleep sure sure that's, why not that's, that's it <laughs> <laughs> thank you and uh, lots of questions are there in the chat box before we go there yeah uh, can you just share a success story i think i'll go to richard first yes. richard one success story which you want to share Uh, with all the participants here early intervention is a big program that uh, it's most child specific now talking about a success story there's quite a lot of success stories but to be most specific i would just try to uh, say one particular child which i've been trying to work for the past 3 months now first identifying the prospectors of what the child can what the child cannot is the way how we work now how lalita ma'am said when a child is not sleeping what happens in the morning the child gets cranky so that is one of the behavior pattern we identify and also talking about the food when the child is not able to have a proper indigestion the child is made to sit in the class the child is more difficult not able to understand what is happening inside the class so again there is a problem which is happening and again there is a behavior outbreak over there now a child trying to focus and understand these kind of things can be done or not is something first we try to put in so what happens is with this one particular child we are able to try to find understand what are the behaviors the child is working what are the behaviors the child is uh, giving access to along with like how we go to like uh, the milestones the child is able to have a proper eye contact if the child is responding the words what we are trying to say if the child is having a proper cognitive function now then we understand and take all the information and i put it as a plan step by step programmatic plan the oral motors just like how lalita ma'am mentioned putting something in the mouth for the child to start chewing would just help the child to start moving the mouth and every time when we feed the child we say ah and the child imitates and while the child is imitating we give so the child understands when we say ah the child says ah we 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 develop a communication of echoing or imitation of what we are trying to say and the child is trying to say so this is how slowly we were trying to teach the child in a step by step way manner for the child to understand it the child was completely verbal the child was not having proper eye contact so after three months now the child is like twinkle twinkle let's start me when i'm asking the child can you sing twinkle twinkle let's start and for the first time when the child opened the mouth and said and called amma the mom was in full tears so every time when the mom keeps calling the child hey look here hey look here hey look here the child doesn't respond but after teasing the child step by step teaching the child this is what you do this is what you do there is something that i wanted to mention there is something called the functional communication now when we follow proper procedure proper setup whatever we teach it comes to a matter of fact that as everything falls into function Yeah, right. Somebody is teaching me uh, a particular word like phone. Okay, now the moment I say I see a phone in somebody's hand, when I say phone, they give me the phone. So I understand that when somebody gives me a phone, all I have to do is just say phone. So we improve the functional communication of the child to know that everything what you see, you say it, I'll take and give it to you. we call it as a requesting or a mandating process where we teach a child that systematically you ask everything so the child is more motivated say for example the child uh, is more motivated to do the things what the toys he or she likes or any particular things what the child likes 
we show it and we wait for the child to communicate it the child is not able to do it we echo it and the child is imitating looking at me the child immediately picks up the word so and later we move into function of we keep the bot we keep the toy in a place that the child can see it and don't give access to it and then the child is able to look through it and then point to me and say the child is already understood that the child cannot get it unless and until the child asks somebody who can take it and give it to the child so you understand it right there is a very proper fill in the blank where we fill every single blank for the child and once the child understanding grows up uh, the development of the brain by 7 years it's fully developed it almost comes to the adult stage so when the child is growing up the neurons in the brain keeps moving around keeps growing it keeps sprouting a lot so every single small small things what we trying to teach to the child in the early intervention program really helps the child to pick up things much faster and once it is set the child is able to produce it or to put it put it in a very expressive way in receptive and expressive you know, put it in a much expressive way and the child understands in naturally i could do the same thing not only at home not only in the center but in every functional place i give i work it out so this success story of a child in 3 months we were able to see the difference of communication being from non verbal starting to be verbal now the child starts singing and calling amma all the time and the parent is very very happy about it and she feels that wow but during the process we also had a lot of behavior problems so every time we taught we always made sure we designed the program in such a way that none of the behaviors interfere with the teaching so we able to contribute to the alternative style as well as we teaching the exact notice of what the child should be learning and recently what happened is the child start also since we been teaching a lot of alphabets now the child started doing this and started writing so the parents are like very very happy about it now this not just one particular child we see the progress in everybody and as i say from mild moderate to severe every child has a different different capabilities and capacity a child may not be able to write but would be allowed to swim but we need to explore the talent and identify it so once we identify it we can always nurture the particular skill for the child and slowly we could teach all the other things so having a very structured process way is really help me out this with the success story of the child and now the child is writing talking singing listening lot of things i myself have more motivated to be along with the child i could see the total progress you know, it's such a happy moment for everybody around and the father who's in abroad we like oh my god i'm waiting to meet my uh, daughter i'm waiting to do this i'm waiting to do all of this so there's a lot of emotion bonding there's a lot of emotional experience there's a positivity that we create not by just shunning the child emotional disturbances there's a lot of chaos that we cause but this is more beautifully that we nurture the child by giving rise to it so this is one of the factors that i wanted to tell everybody on my success story sorry no problem at all you can take your time but you know that feeling when the child calls uh, amma the first time the child who's, who doesn't speak talks for the first time writes for the first time the happiness is so immense for the parents as well as for you right yes. lalita can you share your success story one success story yeah this was a boy who was two and a half years old uh, uh i think uh, the father was a doctor he was intrauterine growth retardation that is the child was having growth retardation even in the fetus the child was delivered they waited till 2 years till the child walked they were in uh, uae and they came to india and child had developmental delay in all the uh, developmental domains areas so and lot of emotional anxiety when the child has retardation in the uterus it it has lot of emotional stress so doesn't want to see anybody else other than the mother so they were brought to uh, refer and they were brought to the early intervention program and uh, all we really knew was he required an intense early intervention program helping him to achieve his developmental in all the areas but the toughest job was he wouldn't leave his mother okay and he will put his finger and he'll be cry this went on for two months he said it's okay the mother can be in the vicinity we can't have the mother completely with him because he won't do anything so she will be at the i side and he will be crying and this went on for a month and slowly he settled down and started uh, you know uh, administering the early intervention program 
uh, to address all his challenges. Cognitive challenges, speech was absolutely zero and um, he could walk, and but he needed more consolidation in his motor skills. And uh, these were the first three domains which we took. Slowly the child moved up and he started saying few words and it went on and an exceptional mother. Whatever we did, we used to give her as a home program and parallel counseling every day. If we tell her to do, say, for 10 minutes, she will do it for half an hour and she will come back and ask, is it okay? What should I do? And that really transpired in the child's development. And the child caught up at least to 60 to 70% in all his domains after two years of intervention. So he came to us at two and a half. By four, four and a quarter, he was speaking he was able to, cognitive functions had improved, but the social domain, which I said comes last, was still stagnating. And uh, in all the other domains, he, uh, you know, he really developed well. So we told the mother to put him in the school and we supported the early intervention program. We don't stop it. So the child initially took time. We handheld the teachers to may, uh, you know, help them understand what he's going through. He may not socialize with other children, but the idea of him, we sending the child to the school is to indirectly benefit this child in the social development too. This child after six months settled down, started yes, learning, yes, academics yes, learning yes, uh, yes. happened and the child progressed and we slowly started weaning the early intervention program to two days a week and he started attending more of school. See what happens is whatever the intervention has been provided unless and until the child is able to generalize and you know, able to perform in the normal environment, it doesn't mean that the child has achieved or we have achieved complete developmental milestone uh, age appropriately has been achieved. He slowly started integrating into the school, started, you know, uh, having friends, socializing with other children and academic learning emerged. So the next year, six months, we just asked them to just go attend school. And once a month, they used to just come for review wherever they had issues. And that was addressed through uh, counseling to the mother. And at one point we said, now he's ready. Please don't even come to the early intervention program, put him in the mainstream and let him get the normal facilitation. Because at that point, the child has to face the challenges which he or she is facing in the normal environment. The child came back last year, he's in grade five, doing regular schooling and very, very minimal socializing. Yeah, he still has a little bit of, oh, who are you? He asked me, that's how it was. And then he came home, you know, when he said, I don't have a car here because my father is not uh, come with us. So can you make some arrangements to drop me? That is the level of communication and the inclusion and the normal mainstream learning he's going through because of the intense early intervention program, which was given, you know, at the right time and in the right way. That, uh, that sums up really how important early intervention is, you know, to put this child from here Thank to, you. to the mainstream, right? Right. Isn't that the ultimate goal? So that right. they all can go to the mainstream and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, act like uh, normal people, have a job and take care of themselves Absolutely. instead of somebody else taking care of them. That should be the ultimate goal. Right. And the early intervention does that. You know? And uh, let me just go to the questions here. Uh, one question from Sakina. Um, is early intervention needed for every child or only special need kids need this? Um, Sakina has asked uh, this question. So one of you can answer that. Um, can I go ahead, Lalita? Yeah, please. Early but in just the phrase, the child, when the child is growing in this world, every step the child is learning something. Now, when there is a delay, we structure it in a very proper way to teach the child in very specific ways. We call it the procedure or a systematic way as early intervention. But every parent, as the child keeps growing up, they keep teaching the child in a way that child wants to learn it independently. Now, some children would be able to pick up things much faster. Some would be able to take it in a very delayed way. So early intervention program, when there is a delay, we do it in a structured format for the child to understand it. If the child is able to outgrow that and start moving much faster, then we understand the capability of the child and the cognitive function of the child and we keep moving on. So, Talking about early intervention is only for child-specific 
is a structured format is what we are trying to do. Can I just add on to this, uh, Meghla? Lalita, please. Yeah. See, early intervention program is for children with who have a little bit of challenges or delay or uh, but the principles of child development is the same. That's what I want every parent to understand. Okay. Feeding, you know, giving variety of food, encouraging them to bite and chew, not making them sit in front of TV and uh, eat, uh, encouraging a lot of physical play. All these things are the principles which we use in early intervention program, but the child is a child here or there. So this principles, I'm, I, I, I really appreciate if all parents can use it and not be, you know, in today's term, they call it as the helicopter parents, be behind them for everything. You have to allow the child to explore. You have to allow the child to explore and learn and develop and not teach them everything. Development is not teaching. See, one day when there is a lag, we give them that some of, even in the early intervention program, I tell people, my team, please don't teach. Be a facilitator. You be a, you take the passive role and help the child to take an active role. That is when you help the child to develop. You can teach everything. What is in it? How will you teach? So please, uh, parents, you know, use the principles of child development. It is the same, whether it's a typical or atypically developing child. But the program as such is for, as Richard said, it's for children who have developmental delay or lag. Okay. Just a little to add. There's one question from Sri Barani. Uh, okay. I think I think it is for generally for uh, all children. Uh, uh, should should we say no to a child? No, Solalama. Will the child get angry? Sri Barani uh, has asked. Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, at appropriate times, you need to make the child understand no. For example, if the child goes and touches, see you will be, uh, touches a fire or a switch. It will put on the switch and leave the finger into the socket. Okay, yeah, what is it. inappropriate has to be a, a, a no is a no. Okay, but no is not a no for everything. Suppose the child wants to play with you and you are reading something. Okay. You can't say, you don't say no for that also. And this also depends upon different ages and different stages of the child's life for what you say no. You understand? So if we are so busy and the child wants to engage with you, you can just at least spend a few minutes and get back to your whatever you have been doing. But something which is hazardous and that something which is just not acceptable, socially not acceptable and inappropriate, I think a no is a no. And, but you don't keep repeatedly telling no, no, no for everything. Exactly. You have to have your yes. Okay. The child yeah. wants you to take you for an ice cream. You don't say no. Okay. Let's go there. You, even though you don't want to buy an ice cream, it's cold or something like that. You say, yeah, we've come for a walk. I think the shop is closed. Can we come sometime tomorrow? It's, it's the quality time and the communication which you spend the child, which makes you take the judgment of when to say no and how to say a no. That is very important. There's one question about a diaper usage. Uh, it's a uh, Parani has asked. Uh, child does not know how to control, or uh, child does not know how to communicate when the diaper is on. So, is uh, when to do this toilet training and when to you know wean away from diapers usage of diapers. Usage of diapers should start early in life. Okay, maybe by one year, one and a quarter. You have to just take it off. And parents need to spend that little bit of time and start training on the toileting. Because okay. if once you do that, even communication will improve. It adds on to the communication. A child is capable of understanding at that stage itself. Well, thank you. Uh, I think yeah. Richard, can add yeah, something. Richard, you can add something there. I just want to add something to the previous uh, what? Uh, yeah, sure, Richard. Uh, referring no. Say, for example, uh, in doing a task or in a teaching task or in trying to mold a particular social skill, okay, when the process is teaching a child, when the child is writing or doing something, we say, no, do like this. And the child is making a mistake, immediately we use more. So during the procedure of trying to do something, we use a lot of no indirectly, but not sometimes understand. Sometimes when I'm working with parents, I could see when the child is trying to talk or do something, no, talk like this. No, don't do this, do this. No, don't do this. 
so the child by indirectly picks up only no because we keep telling no 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 all the time so while teaching a child pausing our sentences in a very particular way by just saying no or sometimes using our hands to take the hand and just keep it would actually develop a way of them to understand that no is only a word by keep on telling the word again and again that actually causes a lot of irritation to the child and they might try to do another behavior escaping or putting tantrum or crying or throwing things and things like that i just want to add on this okay thanks richard uh, one uh, question uh, is early intervention only for children somebody has asked or can adults as uh, as late as 35 uh, can early intervention be done one question has come i think early is for all the parents <laughs> <laughs> Should I take it? Yeah, early is uh, mainly we focus at anything which is diagnosed uh, as early as possible, and providing the intervention. So that is why we say early intervention is you know the age group is zero to seven. But if you still really want to, uh, you know, a thirty-five year old, the program may be not called early intervention. Definitely intervene them. with such intensity as what an early intervention program uh, you know uh, takes care of and help them to develop no harm okay no harm it may not be called early intervention program that's all mm -hmm. okay because it's not early in life it is little later in life that's all later in life that's what what is the core thing you have to understand this it is the structure of the program understanding every individual child's development and to suit the individual child's needs and to make him or her develop this can happen at any time at 35 you understand what he or she is going through and see how much we can help them to develop such intent should be the program in today what happens is once a child is in the special school it's written off that's all that's all the child can do okay he'll be in a special school then they will try to see some vocational program which may not you know be appropriate to what the child's interests are because we try to fit the child into the vocational program we have and the parents don't know what to do after some time they keep them at home and it's a constant constant search for parents what am i going to do with this child so even at 35 i wouldn't mind if you are able to give that intense uh, you know uh, program to the child identify his strength and making more meaningful and make him more independent why not don't call it early intervention that's it <laughs> okay just add on to it yeah, yeah richard um in terms of behavior it is a learning in every situation when a child starts growing as a teen there is a lot of biological changes that happens there are a lot of needs that they need to understand and satisfy themselves with. so there is a learning process in every stage of life so in every area there is a new way of learning so we in behavior patterns we always see in every stages there is something new that we start and we move on so i kind of feel every stage is becoming like a proper functioning of early intervention in the phase of starting say for example a child is becoming a teen there's a lot of hormonal changes that is happening there's a lot of attractions happening towards the opposite sex then we need to teach them step by step how they have to work it out how they have to see how they have to see in all those problems so that is an early intervention in that program the earlier we identify it the earlier we know what are the changes and how we work it out so then the process becomes much easier for us is one question from omar asan my child can understand two two to three step instructions and follow follows it spontaneously but when we ask a question he doesn't understand to, to how to respond okay. is there any uh, problem here but he is verbal and he communicates his needs and wants but he doesn't respond to questions every Uh, he has not given the age of the child so we have to map it to the age of the child i see okay. and see where his understanding level is okay. and uh, maybe build on the vocabulary it needs uh -huh. to be assessed indi indi individually and then the solutions can be definitely provided okay definitely. okay so uh, anybody wants to ask any question i mean you can just go ahead unmute yourself and you can ask after a few years 10 months The child is two years, ten months. They give an answer. Yeah. Anybody uh, is asking? I mean, who's asking? Mohammad Azan has said he's two years, ten months. Mohammad has said two years, ten months. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And he's able to understand two-step instruction, but still not communicating. So yeah. we have to check, uh, look at uh, 
you know, uh, a little more on his cognitive aspects, comprehension, and provide him with little bird. Is he able to point? That is one thing we have to see. Uh, and then provide him with little bit of speech intervention. Uh, just adding on to it, um, when we try to understand when the child is able to understand a command and do it, but not able to understand the question. Uh, now there is a proper assessment that we do. Uh, there is a program called the ABA, is what we follow, Applied Behavior Analysis Program. Uh, in that, we have an assessment called a verbal behavior pattern. So we try to identify in what age or what competitive style the child is in. If the child is only understanding commands like sit, stand, one particular place. Or if the child wants to ask something, but the child is only crying and putting lot of tantrums, but not actually understanding how to ask. So step by step, we try to Once we teach the answer for the child, then we frame a question for the child. Say, for example, first I teach a child to say phone, then the child would be able to get the phone from my hand. Then as I show, I say, what is this? Then the child knows the answer of this. Then the child would be able to say phone. So systematically, they start understanding the progress of how a question has been introduced and how they start answering. It's a very programmatic way. So if the child is not understanding a question, that means the child is still not able to understand the program of what a comparative sentence is and what an objective sentence is of answering and question. So we need to make sure the child first understands the concept of what a question is and what an answer is. And we bring it into a functional communication of in daily life, how the words can be used to move places from one to another to receive things. Once the child has a cognitive function in that program, the child will start picking up the questions. Thank you. Uh... We still have a time for just one question. Anybody wants to ask before we wind up? You can unmute yourself. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, ma'am, could you advise on how to deal with the internet? Not able to hear. Uh, I, was, I think there's, there's a disturbance behind me. Right? Can you advise on, can you just type it in the chat box? There's a little bit of noise behind Meghlai. Okay, I think uh, uh, there's one question here. Yeah. The child does not cry when he bangs his head. Okay. <laughs> Is there any reason behind this? Somebody has asked this. I really want to understand whether the pain sensation is easy able yeah. to feel and yeah. the perception of even you know the hot and cold along with that the, the, the little more perceptions can also be a little uh, uh, you know challenged so we really need to do a sensory assessment to find out if yeah. that is there if that is not there we definitely need to work on it because yeah. pain is something which the child needs to feel okay so that is where i think we need to work yes. on it so that means uh, the child needs help Right. Child needs definitely. So, child needs help. Identifying yeah? that is important. Yes. Right. So uh, I think uh, we can close the session because uh, any questions? We are we are just losing time now, and uh, it's been uh, quite a while. And thanks for being here on this lovely Saturday, and such an enlightening session. So passionate you both are, and so much of service you know to society. I wish the awareness spreads, and each and every word you spoke today is so important for every parent. Uh, whether it is uh, developmental needs or a normal parent, it is so important. And uh, the video, uh, the recording of this video will be posted here in this uh, Facebook page, which uh, which uh, is posted here, Veera has posted it here. Uh, and uh, future events also, all the uh, details will be posted. The next event is actually uh, from a star. It's totally different subject. The star cookery expert Malika Badrinath on uh, 13th of September. So all the details will be there on the Facebook page. Please like the Facebook page. And uh, uh, any closing words, Lalita and Richard, before we wind up the session. Uh, I think, you know, the area has to be like uh, a lot of awareness in this area. And every child who is born, uh, you know, even in the remotest part of our country, gets the best, you know, screened for development, uh, early identification of developmental delays and get the best intervention possible. 
So for me, I would really like to take this forward to see at the policy level, we definitely need to bring in like how a vaccination is mandatory. Early screening should also be mandatory so that we don't miss the boat in the early stages. Thank you one and all for being there on the Saturday morning. Thank you, Meghlai, and my dear friend and colleague, Mrs. Malika Swanathan, who had introduced me to yes. this. And I really enjoyed the session. And thank you once again. Thank you, Lalita. Richard, your closing words for today. Uh, yeah, uh, let us not confine ourselves into the race of this world. Let us take a step back and let us enjoy every single step of the child. Let us cherish the moment. Let us be very lively in what we do. Rather than being worried about why you're not doing this, why you're not doing that, why this, why that, trying to worry ourselves. Just take a step of faith and be still and like, oh wow, you're looking at me. Oh wow, you're touching me. Oh wow. Let the awe factor be the response in what we're trying to do with the child. The child also looks at you, you know. The child understands that emotions and thought of behaviors of what you, she could imitate with you. So just enjoy all the space and life will become, I always tell people, quality of life is the most important need that we always focus on. Every child who we see has to have the quality of life that, yes, I live my life to the fullest. When we identify that, then it's a satisfaction to all of us and a happiness to all of us. So let us not run into the race and let's take things and just like how ma'am said, policy is something that we can actually focus on to try to give more structure or more focus into all the kids, all the people who are in need of. So once that comes, everything will come to the front. Thank you so much for Megle Ma'am. And thank you so much for All India Women's Council. And thank you so much for Lalita Ma'am for sharing the session with her. And thank you so much for all the participants who asked a lot of questions and everything. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lalita and Richard. Thanks, Megle. Uh, thank you, Veera, for you know helping the back screen uh, there. And uh, Pramila Jain also for watching the chat. And uh, you can um, deal, you can contact uh, the two experts. Their contact information is there for any needs which you might have. And uh, thank you all of you for spending your uh, couple of hours on a Saturday morning here. See you next time, next uh, next month for Ask the Expert session. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much.